Welcome back. Welcome to this series of breadcrumbs leading up to the Beer World Festival in December. And we talk with the giants of the industry. Today our guest is Miguel Neves, and Miguel is the editor-in-chief of the Event Manager blog. And Miguel has uh, released a report about the uh, metaverse. Miguel, welcome to the new stage, or should I say, welcome to this metaverse? Maybe. Yeah, why not? <laughs> Can you describe to us what the metaverse is? So the metaverse is, is super exciting. The metaverse is what a lot of people are calling the, the, the future of the internet, the next stage. Uh, some people call it Web 3.0, the idea that we are currently in Web 2.0, where in the social internet, where things like Facebook and blogs and groups kind of uh, are leading the way in many ways. There was an earlier version of the internet, which was more kind of information based. If you remember old, you know, portals and sites like that, it was more, you know, a lot of information. It was almost like a newspaper that went online. That was 1.0. And... Exactly. That was the okay. original kind of internet or when it really started being used uh, beyond, you know, the initial military use and that kind of thing. And Web 3.0 is this idea that we're going to be able to use the internet in a really immersive way. So, you know, mainly through kind of VR glasses or contact lenses or glasses that haven't really been kind of invented yet. But the mm -hmm. idea is that we can jump into virtual worlds. Um, and there are many different types of virtual worlds for business, for pleasure, for gaming, uh, for learning. Uh, and the metaverse is this idea that there's going to be a, a sort of universe around that. So there's many different worlds, but there's really a metaverse or, a, you know, it may not be called metaverse in the future. It might just be what the internet turns into, but rather than you sort of navigating in a visual and reading a website and doing things like that, you may be able to in the future just put on your VR glasses or whatever tool you're using and enjoy the internet. And I think the part that's really exciting for me is that most of the uses that people are conceptualizing mm -hmm. are about shared experiences. You know, and that's where it really connects with events, right? And, and it's more than just a, a game like uh, surroundings where you walk uh, from room to room, uh, for instance, to meet each other. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, at the moment, the best kind of examples of what the metaverse or what I think the metaverse will be are, are games like Fortnite and Roblox, uh, where you where you're there. But what's interesting is these games, um, a lot of what people are using these games for is not the gaming component. So, for example, Fortnite has a creative mode, Fortnite Creative, where you can essentially kind of create levels and do your things. And Roblox mm -hmm. is the same thing. Minecraft as well, those kind yep. of. So the idea is that they're kind of the most advanced things that we have right now or what we think it might turn into. Uh, but they're just the tip of the iceberg for me. They're just where, you know, the ones that are leading in, in some senses. Um, and and. You know, this, this idea of a shared experience, that already exists in Fortnite a lot. You know, Fortnite and other games like it have been incredibly successful and they're all about playing games together. You know, we, Not only we playing sort games, of, there's also um, um, performances in, uh, in Fortnite, isn't there? Absolutely, there's huge performances. Um, at the moment, they're still quite basic. Uh, they're kind of taking a sort of level of the game and putting on a pre-recorded 3D performance, if you will. So it's not quite showing a video, but there's a there's a 3D animation. But they're pretty static, right? The artist is kind of performing. The main difference is that you can be on a level with your friends, and there's probably millions of levels because I think there was something like 20 million people watching the last kind of big one. I think Travis Scott did one. Um, but not everybody watches in the same world together. You're in the world with your friends and you're kind of okay. participating, and you can kind of navigate around the performance so it's slightly different from watching a performance on a, on a kind of video format, but it's still quite basic and, and some kind of elements of the games change and things like that. At least those are the experiences that I've seen. I Very see exciting, I think. I see some possibilities for the BR World Festival here. And uh, we've, we've made steps at the BR, uh, of course, uh, from a physical experience to an online experience last year. This year uh, we'll have one again, even on another platform, but it, it can even grow. and. Um, I think it's it, in, in a way it's funny that the most advanced world that we have is a world like Roblox, which is uh, a blocky, um, a, a low graphic form world. 
Yeah, I think that just comes from the technology and you know the speed of the innovation. Um, if you think about you know early virtual event applications or mobile apps, for example, you remember they were they were blocky, they were clunky, the video feed was yeah. small, you know. And as the technology develops, you get much more real uh, possibilities because things like Roblox uh, are user generated. It's it's almost it's very hard to get really fine detail there. Uh, you know, you need to hire a company to really work with you if you want to go to that level of fine detail. Um, but at the same time, I think that's really exciting because it means that anybody can can grab it, anybody can create their own worlds, and everybody can use it. Uh, and and that for me is, is is where the magic happens. You know, it's not necessarily the most polished version that wins out. But it, in some way, it does does not diminish the uh, the experience. Uh, my, my kids love it and. They feel like they're in a real world when they're playing it. Absolutely, and they've probably hit you up for some Robux, right? To to, to, to buy some things on Roblox. Uh, I mean, I, it sounds silly to us, but I think that side of it is is really interesting. I, I I have to admit, I've not bought any kind of digital real estate or NFTs or any of those kind of things. Mm -hmm. But when I start thinking about the metaverse, I start realizing that these things will actually have value in the future. Because one of the interesting things about the metaverse is that you should, or one of the ideas that people want to put forward is that you can take the things that you own digitally with you on different worlds. Yeah. So if you buy a piece of clothing, if you buy a skin, if you buy a, something that makes you look special on one platform in the future, you'll be able to another platform. Exactly. And that's where that idea of digital ownership is really important so that it's not just a skin that everybody can buy for five dollars, but it's like you bought the one. And, and would, would it also be important, thing. Miguel, uh, to buy your own digital version of the the building that you work in, uh, your, your company building? I, I, you could do, and I think for brands that might be important. But I think what people are really looking for is to build the version of the workplace that you want, mm -hmm. right? And 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 that's where I think companies are still kind of struggling with this concept. It's a little bit like a lot of the VR kind of focused uh, event technology platforms that are rebuilding convention centers. I don't see that much value in that, you know. <laughs> convention centers make sense because they're the they're sort of the best way that we know to gather lots of people in a business context, right? Yeah. Uh, when we need to do it physically, when we do it online, there's no reason for something to be a good of any shape or form. Absolutely. Right. You yeah. can fly around, you can do whatever you want. I mean, I also think um, functions that are more game oriented, like flying around or doing sort of actions, they're not really needed if you're doing a more business or learning context. Mm -hmm. But it's, I think it's good to kind of let our imagination flow and figure out how do we have better ideas? How can we interact better with each other and then build our worlds around that rather than sort of let's take a building and, and put a brand on it. Right? And, and let's make the building look like our real building. <laughs> yeah. 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 So yeah. In, instead of uh, doing this interview with uh, with a nice background and, and, and the nice light that you have, we could do it flying over the, the Metaverse map, maybe. Absolutely. You know, and, and I could show you around the bits of the Metaverse that I've explored yeah. and, and, you know, kind of to take you traveling digitally. Exactly. So that let's make this appointment for next year then. Absolutely. And uh, touching upon it. events, what what the the um, and we were talking about the new stage, of course, and and this metaverse is a kind of new stage. But what would it look like for events? What's the importance for events? I think the importance for events is that we are kind of framed. You know, we're we're we're, we're in Zoom a lot. We're we're in this video frame. And we're in this sort of mode of chatting and, and, and things that we're, we're kind of used to it now. Mm -hmm. And it can work, you know, if it's well moderated, if it's well designed, it can work. But there's still limitations. And when you start to kind of be in an immersive experience, when you start to, in a good way, lose or, or kind of not necessarily know what is real and what's not, then the possibilities are almost endless. So it breaks down the barriers of having a perfect video feed. That's not really what it's about when you're an immersive experience. It's more about, you know, what you look, but what are you doing and what are you talking about? What are you, what are you interacting with? So I think those things... Um, Would it be about once finding you... new ways to share experience, like, like you uh, said earlier? 
Yeah, I think that's that's part of it. Uh, I think it's about creating shared experiences. You know, going back to the basics of why we run events is we run events because we want to kind of build milestones and we build these milestones through doing things together. Um, I think sometimes we miss that when we do video stuff and we do, we do online stuff. Um, we are kind of all on the same platform, but we don't kind of interact in the same way. Uh, and I do think that once we are conceptually more used to something like the metaverse, once we're in these immersive VR worlds and get used mm -hmm. to it, we can really enjoy that. And, you know, I'm sure your, your kids and, and millions of people around the world do this daily as, as gamers. You know, I was reading some, some research on gamers. You know, the average age of a gamer. Can you tell me what it is, the average age, age of a gamer? Well, because the way you asked me, I wouldn't, wouldn't guess too, too low, but uh, let's say 35. Very close, 36. Okay. The average age of the gamer is 36, and I think it's about 46% female. You know, we have this kind of concept of teenage boys being yeah. like the driving force of, of yeah. games, and actually- Big, it's, big mess it's in much... their rooms and, and being in the dark. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's much more widespread more than, than that. that. Yeah. And so it's still relatively young, but I think when this generation becomes comfortable with this, using the same kind of tools or the same kind of environments mm -hmm. for more learning and business concepts, then we're going to shift very quickly into the metaverse. But, you know, but you know. it, it will for a long time be a, a kind of discovery. It will be a kind of um, a journey into uh, unknown lands. We, we don't Absolutely. know yet what, what, will, what would be possible. Absolutely. Um, you know, but gaming engines are evolving all the time. You know, you and I probably have a lot of uh, video technology set up in our homes right now. Mm -hmm. And the price of that video technology and the quality of the video technology was only really attainable by us because it's being used for, for gamers. You know, a lot of cameras, a lot of lights, a lot of things like that were really being used by gamers for the last five, six years. And suddenly the pandemic hit, everybody had to build a home studio and these solutions were there because they're so massively adopted by gamers. So I don't think the kind of transition into the metaverse is going to be that radical. It's more of a feeling comfortable with it. And it pro it's probably going to take a tool that just makes sense. It's probably going to take something that people go, actually, I would like to meet on the metaverse rather than on Zoom. And I really like Zoom. I have no issues with Zoom, but it's it's one meeting room. It's one yeah. meeting device. And it's always more or less the same meeting room with the same exactly. experience. Exactly. Yeah. OK, what so um, but would it be accessible? And I, I don't see many people uh, wearing these VR glasses or being strapped in, in all kinds of um, suits um, with gloves that do things in the metaverse. I think for the full experience, you do need some kind of VR equipment, but VR equipment's really gone down in price. You know, I think for 300, 400 euros, you're getting a, a decent system. Uh, it mm -hmm. won't be top of the range, but you can access it. Most of the platforms that I've seen are offering kind of omni-channel presence. So you can be in the metaverse on your phone, on your desktop, or on your VR glasses. Um, the immersiveness of it will change the level of immersiveness yeah. um, but you can kind of opt for for different things and i think going back to zoom actually i don't know if you've been following kind of the development of zoom events they have kind of a, a big event platform now that's a bit more advanced they've done something really interesting because you have zoom you know where we are and where where, where people have their meetings and now zoom has a sort of lobby um version of it so you can kind of go to different zoom events within this zoom events platform but they also have this 2d model where you can move around and get closer to people and kind of start different chats okay. so even within the same platform there's already different ways of kind of interacting with each other and i think more and more that's what we're going to see so if you're in the metaverse like if you're wearing vr glasses you can go fully immersive if you're not you can still kind of do it on your phone and move your phone around and, and interact and Maybe your avatar won't move their hands in the same way as if you're wearing VR glasses. But I think for everybody else watching, they won't really know the difference. And it will at least be part of the uh, part of the full experience. I think exactly. It, yeah, we'll, we'll, we will try to do use some different platforms than last year, and there will also be a workshop about uh, the metaverse. Um, so there'll be um, things to be learned there. Um, but should we speak about the metaverse, Miko, or is it? one of the metaverses is it a metaverse 
Meet me at a That's metaverse. Why, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, and, and I think different people have different interpretations of it. Um, you know, Meta, uh, Facebook has just changed their company name to Meta. Yeah. You know, I think that's because they want to own the metaverse. Um, and I think a lot of the big companies will want to kind of take a big stake. Um, everybody's kind of pushing towards the metaverse not being owned by anybody. Um, but I feel like the metaverse, I, I normally write metaverse with lowercase m because I feel like metaverse is like the internet. It's not a single place. It's a collection of many, many different places. Uh, so I see the metaverse as like the the common verb, the, the one, sorry, the common noun that really describes all the different immersive possibilities that are out there. And, and yeah, I think I think that's hopefully where we're going. Okay, so let's look back at this interview ten years from now, and then we'll see if if the definition was was close to what we we're experiencing then. Um, this Absolutely. new stage at, at this moment, Miguel, we've just described it and we've described the possibilities there and that we don't know yet what what it will uh, be like in uh, in a few years from now. But what will the future bring? If, is this the end? Will there be new stages after this metaverse? Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I really like your, your the way you're framing it around stages. I think that that's really interesting. Um, but I think I see the metaverse as such a, an open ended stage. You know, for me, it's almost like, I don't, I don't know, it's hard to kind of find a comparison, but it's it, it's like it gives you freedom to really be anywhere you want to be. You know, as soon as you kind of allow yourself to be immersed in it, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like it's kind of like a Zoom background that you can change at any point, but it doesn't just affect the stuff behind you. It affects how everybody is interacting in that one meeting. So it's not a Zoom background anymore. It's a it's a Zoom world, right? And if you can do that, and if you can do that purposely, purposefully, sorry, I think the possibilities are endless. Would it also have a risk in it? Uh, I'm just imagining maybe it's it's also the um, the, the, the type um, of gamer that we had in mind. This boy in a dark room, uh, it's a mess, and he's watching his his screen and playing a game. Would it be a risk for us? being uh, immersed in the metaverse, um, that we would not be in the real world anymore? Is it a, a world that you can spend your whole life in? Absolutely. I think there's always a risk, um, but I think that's already happening now. You know, I don't know if you've followed the kind of digital addiction issues that many gamers are having around the world. I don't think we need the metaverse to get there. Um, there's probably I, I'd like to see some studies about it. I don't I don't have the sort of you know studies to show you or anything. I think there may be some extra possibility of addiction if you get kind of lost and if, if the technology becomes so good that you can not understand the difference between reality. Um, but everything I've seen in terms of you know the claims that violent video games cause people to go out and do violent things, everything mm -hmm. that I've seen in that regard has been disproven. You know, people, humans know the difference between what is a game yeah. and what is and what is reality. People do bad things, but it's not linked to, you know, things that they play in games necessarily. So I would say probably yes, but I don't know if there's any more risk because there already it's is. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Okay, that's clear. So uh, one of the classical quest classic questions that we have in this um, breadcrumb interview is if you uh, look uh, back at the past few years, past two years, um, are there any um, um, evolutionary um, uh, development? Was there something that you think is permanently changed since COVID? Oh yeah, like so many things. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, let me limit it to events then. Absolutely. Um, I think the biggest thing that's changed is actually to do with the workforce. I think it's to do with how comfortable we are being at home it's to do with the remote working uh, mm -hmm. that I think a lot of people have experienced and how companies have dealt with it. Um, there are things that are not good about remote working, but I know I've been remote working for a number of years now and I would actively do everything I can to stay remote working um, wherever I can. You know, I've changed my life to work well with remote working. I have two There's kids There's big now, advantages for you. Exactly. And even when it comes to thinking about attending physical events, there's more challenges. There's more um, 
it's not that I don't want to attend physical events, but my world is more based around my home now. Do you have to be convinced to come to a physical event? I think so. I and think what would we be the argu convinced. argument that could convince you there? What would be something you would go for? I think, you know, ultimately it's about you have to be there. You know, and I think that there's an element of watching it. You know, when you have a hybrid option, when you can watch it remotely, I think we know that we can get content and we can watch interesting speakers and have interesting conversations, perhaps. But there's things that you can only really do in person. And I think the thing that I'm really missing from not attending any events for, for a couple of years is is actually the, the kind of tangential conversations. It's the, mm, you said something really interesting and I'd like to kind of pick your brain about it. I'm missing that um, yeah. more than specific content or specific you know people or things to do like that. So, and I think I'm not alone. Uh, and then added to that is also the fact that all these companies where people work and associations and things have been doing business and have been kind of mm -hmm. things kept moving for a couple of years. And so it's very hard to kind of say, well, I have to go to this event or I have to travel you know, across the world to this meeting. It's like, but we've done OK for the last couple of years. Do we really have to do that? Yeah. Um, and I'm not criticizing it. I, I just feel like that's something that I'm feeling internally. And I think a lot of people around the world are doing that. And, you know, the added risk, et cetera, with corporations, you know, not really wanting their people to travel. I think that's all going to add up to yeah. A little bit of a perfect storm where it's like let's let's make sure we really have good reasons to be there maybe it's also a permanent change uh, well, that you have to make this this conscious choice uh, of going or not going so i could convince I, you to come to a, to a, a physical um, uh, conference if i would uh, promise you that not the whole program would be blocked with content but there would be ample space of meeting people um and, and just having random conversations that would convince you to come yeah I, I, it sounds weird and i've 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 challenged this a lot and i think what happens is we are sort of tuned into the way we do event marketing is always about keynotes and is always about big brands and big names and sort of you know convincing people that they should really watch this or, or do that uh, but i do think that the bigger value comes from the serendipity and the conversations and you know, connecting with people, not connecting with brands, you know, not like big names are attracting me or big keynote speakers. So it's it's easy, you know, I don't know if it's like easy to dismiss, but I feel like if you can communicate that in a way that's succinct and, and I can make a business case around that, then I think that's the way forward. You know, saying, look, you're going to meet these people, they're going to share these ideas, and then you're going to have an opportunity to really take it beyond that. That's the, not easy to do online. Um, maybe it will be easier in the metaverse. Maybe, maybe. Uh, uh, yeah, and, and I think the other thing is when we meet online, it's always kind of like, oh, I've got a half an hour slot. I'm going to jump in and then I'm going to jump out and do something yeah. else. So if I'm going to commit to traveling, I want to do that. I might also see if there's other things that I can do in the same place or same city that can make that trip really worthwhile. So I think it is really going to be about making it worthwhile for that extra effort. It feels like much more extra effort than before to plan mm -hmm. flights and hotels and etc. So I want to make sure that there's sort of extra value attached. And I think that's really going to convince me. Yeah, OK, OK. I'll keep that in mind for the next invitation <laughs> for a conference there. Let me go. OK, so about this new, ver the new stage uh, called the metaverse or a metaverse, uh, do you like it? Would it be yeah, a thumbs up I or a thumbs it. down for you? It would definitely be a thumbs up. Thumbs um, up for the metaverse. Yeah, definitely. And if, if we would talk about uh, a contribution connected to the net metaverse or uh, uh, some other image of the um, new stage, what would be your contribution to our Spotify playlist? Well, I chose uh, Imogen Heap's uh, Hide and Seek, um, which is a song I really like. It's It's not that it's pretty old now. It must be 10 years old, something like that. Mm -hmm. I chose it because of it, it has a I, I used to be into music production. So forgive me if I get a bit geeky, but it has a very <laughs> interesting use of technology that you don't hear in a lot of songs. So she sings. It's a very it's a vocal performance with, with some keyboard background and she sings um, over a, a sort of vocoder. I don't know exactly what she's using, but she's She's kind of playing certain notes, and when she hits those notes, the voice kind of moves through these chords. So essentially what you're hearing from her is like 
chords so or it's more like there's four of her singing at the same time but she's doing this through technology and i think there is it's a very interesting use of technology a little bit like the metaverse where you're kind of expanding and doing something that not many other people are doing and and getting a really interesting result with it okay so it sounds immersive to me uh, we're going to, <laughs> i'm going to listen to it uh, thank you miguel thank you for this interview and uh, you. to you our viewers thank you for watching and if you get um, curious about this song by Imogen Heap, just listen to our Spotify playlist. If you want to see more of these breadcrumbs, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. I hope to see you at the next breadcrumb. And of course, I hope to see you in the metaverse that is called Be Our World Festival in December. See you there. Bye-bye.